Okay, on behalf of everyone here at the Center for Brain Health, I want to welcome you to the Frontiers of Brain Health lecture series where we take a deep dive into the most exciting new developments in brain research. My name is Bart Ritma. I'm a professor at the University of Texas School of Behavioral and Brain Sciences. And I want to mention that we'll have a few minutes at the end to answer any questions you have. So please use that Q&A function uh, and we'll get to as many of those questions as we can at the end. And this presentation will be recorded. Um, for those of you who don't know much about us, uh, the Center for Brain Health is a cognitive neuroscience research center at the University of Texas at Dallas. We have uh, dedicated the past three decades to exploring neuroplasticity and the brain's amazing lifelong potential to get stronger and work better. Stay, uh, stay till the end to hear about the, our groundbreaking research study, the Brain Health Project. Now I'd like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Bok Young Park. Dr. Park examines how individuals' cultural backgrounds can uh, shape their social, cognitive, and affective processing. She is particularly interested in the neural mechanisms underpinning how cultural influences uh, how, how, sorry, how culture influences individuals' moral judgments, how culture shapes one's desired affective states, and how culture explains people's theory of mind across different social and relational contexts. Dr. Park received her bachelor's degree from Seoul National University in Korea and her uh, doctorate from Stanford University in Palo Alto, California. Now she is assistant professor here at the University of Texas at Dallas School of Behavioral and Brain Sciences. Dr. Park. Hi everyone, glad to meet you virtually. And then thank you so much Bart for this warm introduction. Um, today I am going to talk about a few projects centered around group membership or the perception of who belongs to our group. People often very easily sense strong signals of group membership from others, like here. So the signals can be the costumes what school you attend, your nationality, race, gender, or a random group a greening social psychologist assign you to in a laboratory. In addition to the different signals of group membership, in groups can be defined by your relational experiences. For example, family members and friends are representative in group members. The reason why group membership matters is that it allows you to figure out who is trustworthy. People are more likely to perceive their in-group members as more moral than those from outside of their group. And this tendency to evaluate in-group members as more moral is manifested in two important ways, which I will focus on for today's talk. First, people may say, you are in my group, I trust you, and I am not going to change this regardless of what you do. So people view to others antisocial behaviors or selfish behaviors can be influenced by in-group status. Second, people may say, you are in my group, I trust you, so I want to be nice to you. So group membership also promotes people's pro-social behavior toward others. Let's jump into the first one. Um, I want to introduce Mr. Chris Perko to you. In November 2004, he attacked his parents while they were sleeping. He attacked them with an axe, left the room, leaving significant injury to both of them. He was arrested, found guilty for murdering his father and attempting murdering his mother. He currently is serving his sentence. So, his mother survived the attack. I mean, she lost one of her eyes and then got permanent scars, but she survived. She could even make it to the court to testify. And then what she said was that she believed her son was innocent. So um, this is a super extreme case, but it makes a very important point. 
Often we do not change our belief about in-group members' moral trait, even in the face of very strong counter evidence. What about other less extreme cases? Let's say you find your best friend stealing some money from your wallet. Although you may be very surprised by finding this out, you may give your friend the benefit of the doubt and may not completely overturn your judgment about this friend. So in-group status reduces the influence of others' antisocial behavior on our moral judgment. This phenomenon has been around in social psychology for decades. We know that this effect is solid. Okay then, what do we not know? Well, we do not know the precise mechanism through which people discount in-group members' negative behaviors. And taking advantage of the recent development in computational approach, my colleagues and I modeled this. And we specifically focused on group membership based on one's relational experiences with others or one's friend for this research. First, when someone does something we did not expect, we experience prediction error. It is the discrepancy between the expectation that we had about this person and the actual behavior this person displays. This unexpectedness is critical for updating one's judgment about others because if a target behaves exactly in the expected ways, there is no need to update one's evaluation about this person. So maintaining one's moral judgment for in-group members may be accounted for by discounted representation of a precision error signal we experience about those in-group members. In other words, we may not learn from prediction error signals when it is about our in-group members. Moreover, previous studies found that when people effortfully process social information, they show increased activity of right temporal parallel junction, or RTPJ. Thus, not blaming in-group members' negative behaviors may mean that people do not put the effort to process those bad behaviors, which would be associated with decreased RTPJ activity. To test these predictions, participants were led to believe that they were observing their close friend, so whom they brought to the lab, and a stranger whom they met at the lab were taking turns and gave money to them or took money away from them while they were lying on the scanner bed. After observing the giving or taking behaviors of the target, participants made a moral judgment, either how trustworthy the target was or how close they felt to the target. Okay, here um, in the upper panel, participant rating about their friend um, should be in green, and then rating for the stranger is in red. On the axis, you can see different conditions. And then regardless of the conditions, participants rated their friend more positively. But what we wanted to see was how much people update their range between the trials. And then as predicted, replicating previous research, regardless of whether their, whether their friend gave or took, participants did not change their range for their friend a lot, meaning that they maintained their positive judgment for friend. 
OK, so that is participant behavior rating part. How about their neural activities? So prediction error could occur when participants observed the giving and taking decisions of their friend and the stranger, which we focused for further neural analysis. Participants showed overall more reduced RTPJ activity in the friend condition. And then this pattern was more pronounced when their friend took money from them. And this was the, con this was the condition that RTPJ activity significantly tracked participant ratings. The lower RTPJ they showed, the more positive ratings they gave to their friend, although their friend took money from them. Supporting our hypothesis that decreased the RTPJ activity would account for more positive moral judgment. Then what does modeling say about this process? We fitted models to explain through what psychological process participants arrived at these ratings. The model assumed a latent variable, which we call as prediction, um, that participants had regarding how much their friend or the stranger would give to them or take from them. This prediction V is updated in every trial based on the prediction error or the discrepancy between what the participant expected this target to give or take and what this target actually gave or took. So um, these were the um, components that we were interested in. The model just assumes that people use this prediction to make their ratings, which the model to try to estimate, but I will save it for later Q&A for the sake of the time. From the best feeding model, which I will explain soon, we extracted the trial by trial prediction error signals. Participants experienced more positive prediction error when the stranger gave money to them, and more negative prediction error when their friend took money from them, which makes sense. However, this does not seem to be consistent with the behavioral ratings. So as you can see here, participants were more negatively surprised by their friends taking behavior, but they still didn't change their moral judgment about friend and gave their friend more positive ratings. How come this could be the case? Let's go back to the model. Actually, we fitted multiple models, and the key difference between these was about this alpha term or the learning rate. As you can see here, it scaled the effect of a prediction error into the updated prediction about the target. If alpha is very high, close to one, that means this trial by trial prediction error is largely integrated into the prediction about this target in the next trial, meaning that this person learned a lot from the prediction error. In contrast, if alpha is very low, close to zero, the means prediction error is disregarded, and this person doesn't learn from prediction error. The model was the best fit when we assumed that participants learned from giving and taking conditions differently, and more importantly, they learned from their friend's behavior and the stranger's behavior differently. These are the learning rates from the best feeding model. We found that overall, participants showed reduced learning rate in the friend condition meaning that they disregarded the prediction error and didn't learn from it when it was about their friend. Another way to test this would be by looking at the associations between participant prediction error signals 
and how much they changed their judgment about the targets. And um, here are those associations. So we took the absolute values of both the prediction error and the participant updating in moral judgment. So these are basically the um, correlations between the size of these variables. And then in all conditions, the greater prediction error participant experienced, the more they changed their, their judgment. However, the effect of a prediction error on more judgment updating was smaller in the friend taking condition than all the other conditions. We also found that more reduced RTPJ activity was associated with less negative prediction error signal in the friend taking condition. So, although participants were more negatively surprised by their friend taking behaviors, they did not learn from these behaviors. And this underrepresentation of a prediction error signal was tracked by decreased RTPJ activity, ultimately contributing to more positive ratings. Now, maybe you are wondering why this is important. So people changed their moral judgment for their friend less based on about an hour of interaction in the scanner. So what? They already know their friend very well, so it totally makes sense that they do not update their judgment because of these limited interactions. Um, I have some answers to that. So um, first, we had exactly the same question. So we measured the participant prior experiences with their friend. So um, how long they have known each other, how often they communicate with each other, and so on. And then these indexes never predicted how much a participant maintained or changed their moral judgment. Second, our findings provide some preliminary evidence to reject an alternative account. So one possible mechanism suggested by previous research is that people may discount in-group members' bad behaviors effortfully. In other words, they may generate auxiliary hypotheses to explain away these behaviors. So my friend stole money from me, but maybe she was in bad mood today. Maybe she misunderstood something. Maybe I forgot to return the money I borrowed from her before. The key thing is that this required effortful process of social information, which would activate RTPJ. But given that we found decreased RTPJ activity in the friend condition, people might not put this effort to look for excuses for their friend's behaviors, but maybe they effortlessly ignored the bad behaviors when they made moral judgments. Lastly, we found that updating moral judgment for a friend based on these limited interactions was associated with people's real-world relationships. What we predicted was that by keeping their belief that one's friend is a good person, people may maintain a broadened social network that can in turn increase social fitness. To test this prediction in an online survey, we asked a group of participants to imagine that their best friend did some different positive and negative behaviors and measured how much they updated their judgment about the friend. And then participants indicated how many friends they had in real life by choosing one of these categories. Okay, on this graph, excesses is the category of number of friends participants chose. Y axis indicates how many participants chose each category. Blue bars will represent participants 
who never changed their moral judgment about their friend. Brown Bart, participant who negatively changed their judgment after imagining their friend doing something bad. As you can see here, the distributions were significantly different. Participants who never changed their impressions were more likely to say that they have 20 to 49 friends, while those who negatively changed their moral judgment for friends were most likely to report having three to five friends. Moreover, from the neural imaging data that were, we were talking about a few minutes ago, we also found that participants who showed more decreased RTPJ activity in response to their friend taking behaviors were also those who reported having more friends. So maintaining moral judgment in favor of one's in-group members may have real-world benefits such as maintaining more friendships. OK, so we have been talking about how we process information about others depending on group membership. But this is only one piece of the puzzle. So in-group status influences how we perceive others' behavior, but in everyday social interactions, the behaviors are bi-directional. As well as others behave toward us, we also behave toward others. And the previous research found that not only shaping our perception about others' behaviors, discounting their um, negative behaviors, in-group status also promotes our positive behavior toward others. And this process is not limited to only our family and friends. Although I have been focusing on close friend and representative in-group members, a lot of our in-group members are actually coming from outside of our friend and family circles, signaling group membership in different ways. Especially in this multicultural society, we receive signals regarding group membership from everywhere. For example, in this picture, you can very quickly notice some salient cues such as race and gender. And these explicit signals have been the center of the research in the field for decades. However, there is something else going on here. This um, another cue rather implicit and harder to quantify, but potentially more powerful and malleable, is actually extensively studied in the context of person perception and social judgment. It largely governs how we feel when we first meet someone. It is very salient and noticeable. However, this has been seriously understudied in in-groupness literature, and the influence of culture on this cue had been under-examined either. This implicit cue is the emotion that others express. And for the rest part of my talk, my purpose is to convince you that emotional expression can signal group membership for people from different cultural backgrounds. This signaled in-groupness will be manifested on more favorable moral judgment about the target, which would influence our subsequent pro-social behavior toward them. Affect evaluation theory provides us a theoretical background. So if I ask you, how do you want to feel right now? I bet all of you would like to feel happy, good, excited, all sorts of positive emotions. But if I ask you, ask you how you actually feel right now, some of you may say you are bored, maybe you are tired because of some deadline, 
or just feeling nothing. And hopefully some of you say you are excited to see my talk and academically very intrigued. So as you can see here, what you want to feel or your ideal effect and what you actually feel or your actual effect are distinctive to each other, which is suggested by effect evaluation theory. Importantly, ideal effect is more largely influenced by culture than actual effect. So on the two-dimensional affective circumplex, cir circumplex mapping valence and arousal, previous studies consistently found that European Americans want to feel high arousal positive states more than East Asians, such as feeling excited and enthusiastic, while East Asians want to feel low arousal positive states more than European Americans such as feeling calm and peaceful. From now on, I will use HEP to refer to high arousal positive state and LEP to refer to low arousal positive state throughout this presentation. Given that the signal of shared values can be critical for the perception of in-group status, my colleagues and I predicted that the expression of one's ideal effect may signal in-group status as well, leading to pro-social behaviors. We coined a term ideal effect match to refer to the times when people's ideal effect matches the emotional state expressed by targets. For example, if somebody who wants to feel happy is paired with an excited target, there is ideal affect match, which may lead this person to perceive this target as more trustworthy and behave more pro-socially compared to a calm target with which this person expressed, sorry, experiences ideal affect mismatch. On the other hand, if somebody who wants to feel left is paired with a calm target, there is ideal affect match. To test these predictions, we created different target faces varying emotional expressions. We labeled this type of open mouth smile as excited and this type of closed mouth smiles as calm and measured participant pro-social behaviors to these targets in various contexts. We found consistent patterns in simple preference decisions and more high order resource sharing decisions, including giving, trusting, and lending decisions. Um, I will zoom in two of them today. Start with giving. In this study, participants received some money and could decide how much of the money they would like to share with the presented target. Participants made their uh, donations or offers to a series of different target faces. They received a new money at the beginning of each trial, so they um, so their offers to different targets were independent to each other. We recreated European Americans and Koreans as representative groups that value HAP and, Le and LAP respectively. After participants made um, giving decisions to all targets, they viewed a subset of the targets again and rated to what extent they perceive each target as trustworthy, along with other personality measurements. We also measured the participant ideal and actual effect, and here are the results. First, European Americans wanted to feel HEP in this black bar more than LEP in this white bar. Um, different letters indicate significant differences. 
European Americans offered more to the exceeded target than to the current target. And they perceived exceeded target as more trustworthy than current target. Koreans, on the other hand, showed exactly the opposite patterns. They valued LAP more than HAP, offered more to the current target than to the excited target, and rated the current target as more trustworthy than excited target. This pattern persisted regardless of the race and gender of the target. So between the targets sharing the same racial and gender characteristics, European Americans always gave more to the excited target, while Koreans always gave more to the calm target. Mediation analysis revealed that European Americans wanted to feel lap more than HAP, which led them to perceive excited target as more trustworthy than calm target which ultimately made them offer more to the excited target than to the current target compared to their Korean counterparts. Participant actual effect did not change these findings. So we found empirical evidence showing that in-groupness signaled by ideal effect match promotes pro-social behavior through increased perception of trustworthiness. Then, what would be the underlying neural mechanism? So, from the first part of this talk, you may remember that decreased RTP activity was underpinning more positive moral judgment for in group members. So, replicating this in a new context, we predicted that decreased RTP activity would be again associated with more positive, positive moral judgment for a target whose emotional expression matches participant ideal effect, which would in turn associated with greater giving. So um, another group of participants looked at different target faces in the scanner and indicated how much they would like to give to each target. And again, the more that they valued HAP over LAP, the more they offered to the excited target than to the calm target. And the more they valued LAP over HAP, the more they offered to the calm target than to the excited target. Then we looked at the brain activity right before participants made these offer decisions. First, we found that Decreased RTP activity preceded greater giving decisions. You can see this linear decrease of RTPJ along with increasing subsequent offers. Moreover, this RTPJ activity was also significantly modulated by ideal affect match. The more participants wanted to feel HAP over LAP, the higher RTPJ activity they showed in response to the calm target, and then the more participants wanted to feel LAP over HAP, the higher RTPJ activity they showed in response to the excited target. Confirming our predictions, decreased the RTPJ activity was associated with greater trustworthiness rating for the target. So, ideal effort match enhanced perception of trustworthiness of the target, which decreased RTPJ activity, which ultimately made participants offer more to those targets. So decreased RTPJ activity accounted for the effect of ideal effort match on pro-social decisions. Then would these effect generalizable into the real world? To address this question, we looked at lenders' lending decisions in Kiva website. Kiva provides a platform that lenders with various cultural backgrounds can personally lend money to different borrowers 
without any financial interest. We predicted that given lenders from nations that value HAP more would be more likely to lend money to borrowers who showed excited smiles in their pictures, while lenders from nations that value LAP more would be more likely to lend money to borrowers who showed calm smiles in their pictures, which they present on the website. Um, this is a sample loan request page. So lenders see the photos and descriptions of the borrowers and can fund money to the borrowers. So the borrowers can use the money to continue their business or initiate new ones. For instance, this borrower wants to borrow money to buy a pig and food for her farm animals. So lending in this context has meaningful downstream impact. Among about a million lenders, we focused on those who are from the nations that we had some idea about the national level of ideal affect. So including nations in North America, Western Europe, and East Asia. We randomly sampled the same number of lenders from each of these nations and tested whether the national level of ideal affect predicted the facial expression of the borrowers who received money from these selected lenders. We downloaded the borrowers um, who received money from our selected lenders and coded their facial expressions as excited and calm. I will plot the relationship between the national level of ideal affect and the borrower's facial expressions. National ideal lap was not significantly associated with borrower's facial expressions, but we found that national level of ideal hat significantly predicted greater occurrence of excited smiles of the borrowers. So the more the nation values HEP, the more likely lenders from that nation lent money to excited borrowers. In contrast, we found that the more the nation valued HEP, the less likely lenders from that nation lent money to calm borrowers. So there is some evidence that mismatch between lenders ideal affect and the borrower's emotional expression decreases pro-social decisions. So the effect of in-group status signaled by culturally shaped ideal affect match is also manifested in naturally occurring field data as well as in well-controlled experimental context. All right, um, I think now is a good time to wrap up. So first, how in-group status influences our view to others' negative behaviors. My colleagues and I addressed this classic social psychology question using recently developed computational and neural approaches, finding out that decreased learning from the prediction error signal and decreased RTPJ activity accounted for moral judgment maintenance. Second, how in-group status influence our behavior to others. In the second line of my research, we looked at whether emotional expression of others can signal in-group status dependent on the perceiver's cultural background. And then as predicted, we found that culturally shaped ideal affect makes people positively perceive certain others or those whose emotional expression matches their ideal affect and show more pro-social behaviors toward them. Importantly, target race and gender never significantly modulated the effect of ideal affect match, suggesting that emotional expression may signal group membership very strongly 
above and beyond these traditionally studied features. Combining these in one of my current research, my lab is examining the computational and neural mechanisms of cultural influence on moral judgment. We have some exciting pilot data that we scanned here at the Brain Health Center, and I am happy to talk more about that if you are interested. Okay, so um, we live in the most diverse and dynamic social environment throughout the entire human history. Understanding what factors shape our perception of others and the subsequent interactions with them would be critical to successfully navigate the social world. I hope my project so far and my future research can have some real world implications in this dynamic multicultural society. Um, I just want to thank my amazing collaborators on this project. And then I love it that a majority of them are showing these excited smiles in their official profile photos. Okay, uh, let me stop here and take questions. Thank you. Okay, very nice presentation, Vok Young. Um, we have a couple of questions. Um, so I guess uh, the first question involves uh, how uh, is what the mechanism precisely by which uh, people uh, go about uh, sort of, I guess, affording more generous judgments to uh, those that they identify in their in-group who've, you know, let's say, I guess, taken money from them. Um, and is it a matter of uh, making excuses for their negative behavior or do they just overlook their negative behavior? So it is a matter of sort of actively generating some some thoughts and beliefs about this person that sort of, uh, I guess, uh, align their behavior with who they are. Uh, that's that's sort of, I guess you'd say positive in some way, or is it a matter of actively ignoring that sort of forgetting that? So you know, sort of consistent with somewhat other other belief kind of maintenance mechanisms where people tend to select, you know, use selective memory, I suppose you would say. Is it a matter that they just tend to forget those things that that are uh, that are inconsistent with their beliefs about the person? Yes, that is a wonderful question. And then that is actually one of the motivations um, that we conducted our first study. So the one that I um, presented at the beginning. So um, we hoped that the um, RTPJ activity could give us some hint to kind of figure that out. And then as I introduced, RTPJ is associated with effortful process of social information. So when RTPJ activity is more increased, that means people kind of deliberately process the information given to them. And then what we found was that we found decreased RTPJ activity was tracking more positive ratings about one's friend, especially when the friend took money from the participant. So we want to suggest that um, for now, it seems people kind of effortlessly overlook their friend's bad behaviors and then just keep giving the same good ratings to their friend. Um, one thing to note is that in our um, paradigm, because of, of the nature of the fMRI study, um, participants had limited time, so they only observed their friend behaviors for like um, two seconds or so. Um, so it is still an open question um, whether people will use more effortful process and then will generate some excuses to explain away their friend's bad behaviors when they had unlimited time. So that's an open question. Right, so that brings me to, to another question, which is, uh, sort of if people would repeatedly experience, you know, I don't know exactly how your trials were constructed, but if people repeatedly experience a friend uh, exhibiting antisocial behavior, at what point does that sort of mechanism shift to some sort of uh, uh, kind of recalibration of, of the assessment of that person? Okay, I love the question because that's about the tipping point. And then, okay, actually, <laughs> Um, before I did this study, we wanted to um, examine the tipping point first. 
So like um, after accumulated experience uh, with your friend, especially negative behaviors, when are you going to tip? And then when are you going to con start continuing giving bad ratings to your friend? We did a lot of pilot tests, and then actually we found that it is very difficult to find the tipping point within one hour interaction, <laughs> within about 100 trials with your friend. So um, that is kind of like still a question that we want to investigate in our future research, but I think that kind of requires more like um, lasting experiences, maybe over like a few years or something, maybe at least a few months. Um, that is, so that is a really great question, but we are still thinking how to make it possible to test it in an experimental setting. Uh, one question too, so you've mentioned the role of the right temporal parietal junction uh, and its, it's sort of featured role in these judgments. Uh, do you believe that this that these judgments um, that this region is the exclusive or sorry these judgments are the exclusive province of this region or do you think that it plays a role in sort of a larger network of let's say social uh, kind of judgment like social judgment network or something? Uh, that's a wonderful question either. So uh, it is like one of the reasons in a well-known theory of mind network and then well the network is composed of many different regions and then it they kind of cooperative cooperatively work to figure out what other people are thinking. RTPJ has been um, known to be the center of this network such that the development of this specific region kind of overlapped with like the time children start to think think about others mind when we like um, deactivate RTPJ by TMS then people cannot really process like important social information and everything so cumulative research kind of points that RTPJ is the center but we do not know whether these findings are specifically about the RTPJ, RTPJ itself or whether like um, for example by decreasing RTPJ activity we might disrupt like um, the entire network right like so the connection between RTPJ and other regions in this network so um, that kind of requires some more um, investigation but at least what we know now is that RTPJ is one of the central regions in this function. Uh -huh. OK, uh, another question is coming from the uh, from the Q&A. It, it, it sort of goes to the question of how do people uh, go about uh, making in-group versus out-group judgments about others? So uh, uh, it might be on, on the basis of things like their appearance, but it also might uh, be on the basis of the of the values that they express. Um, so so do you have any uh, any uh, information? This would sort of be, I guess, sort of kind of on the front end of this process. How do people evaluate others with respect to their in group status, with respect to the to the person who's doing the judge and making these judgments? OK, that is a really great question. Let me see. So as I kind of tried to introduce at the first beginning, there can be two different types of in-groupness, right? So one is about signaled in-group. So such as when you first meet somebody, you kind of see that, okay, this person shares the same race with me. This person is also female like me. This person smiles, like um, has this open big smile. Um, I think I kind of, we kind of, we kind of are like in the same group, from the same group. So that is one. Another one is more relational in-group status. So it's more about like um, you build this in-group status over time, such as what you do with your friends and family members. Um, so there are two different sources. And then of course, like um, you are a signaled in-group member can like um, change into relational in-group member like um, over time. Um, yeah. And then like um, when people see like strangers, I would say it is more about the signaled in-groupness. I see. OK, um, so um, that uh, sort of I think exhausts the questions that 
we have um, at this time. Uh, so um, if there aren't any more questions coming into the chat, I seem to this that there's one more, but I can't seem to get this from someone. But so I think we'll uh, we'll close it there unless there are any other questions coming in and um, and, and we'll wrap it up there. So thank you, Boke Young, and um, we want to um, then um, move on to uh, describing our um, our brain health project. Lifelong brain health is our shared mission, and uh, so we want to thank Dr. Park and um, and uh, our our audience and those who contributed questions. Um, and so we'll go from there. So um, the Brain Health Project uh, uh, involves the power of research that truly lies in how we use it to make the world a better place. So we've launched a large scale landmark study about maintaining and, and improving brain health, um, brain health and performance. Uh, so if you're interested in learning more about the Brain Health Project and possibly participating in it, uh, please scan the QR code you see there. Uh, on your screen uh, with your phone uh, and uh, visit the brainhealthproject.org. That's the brainhealthproject, all one word, dot org. And for those of you who are interested in CEU credits for these talks, please email ceu.utdallas.edu. And I want to thank you for joining us and we look forward to seeing you virtually on December 3rd for our last lecture of the series with Dr. Lynn Lynn from the University of North Texas. Thank you, everybody. We work, we live, we innovate, and create. At the center of it all is your brain health. The ability to solve problems, think analytically, share empathy, and thrive. We're trying to make brain performance really the next fitness revolution. So how do you boost brain power? Welcome to the Brain Health Project, an urgent call to transform your mind to work stronger and faster. This is an absolute crisis, as great as any we have ever faced. We have to equip the minds and brains of our citizens to cope with the accelerating, dizzying rate of change that they face in their lives. Your brain health is not fixed, Scientific discoveries prove it can adapt and grow regardless of your starting point. Our greatest value, the asset that will help us to change everything, every problem we're in, is all in our head. To harness that treasure, we must measure and monitor progress while things are going well versus waiting for an injury or disease to strike. Too many of us are outliving our brains, and that does not have to be the case. The information age is bombarding us with more content than our human brains can handle. How do you keep from getting lost in this and focus on deep thinking? For starters, stop multitasking. Science shows us that multitasking is bad for your brain. It reduces fluid intelligence, causes brain atrophy, and increases chronic stress. The global pandemic is creating more stress than ever. Stress that leads to depression and anxiety and beyond. Unlocking our potential to navigate these hurdles starts with learning the right strategies, even in school. So when teachers have these strategies, they're empowered to support our learners, and then the learners are now able to take ownership of their learning. Training kids how to think is doubling academic achievement among middle schoolers. I think the greatest national security threat is pre-K through 12. If we don't take care of educating our young men and women, then we have to ask ourselves, where, where are we going to be in 20 years? Our world-renowned scientists know you can increase your brain health, not lose it. It's time for a new category of health, brain health. You are a game changer. Ready to transform the world with us? Be a part of the brain health revolution. It starts here.